Good afternoon. My name is Michael Smith. I'm the executive director of the My Brother's Keeper Alliance at the Obama Foundation. Thank you all for joining us for this critical and important conversation today. The killings of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, and the loss of far too many black lives to list have left our nation anguished and outraged. More than a thousand people are killed by police every year in America and black people are three times more likely to be killed than white people. We can take steps and make reforms to combat police violence and systemic racism within law enforcement. Together, we can work to redefine public safety so that it recognizes the humanity and the dignity of every person. This town hall that we're having today is a part of an ongoing My Brother's Keeper Alliance town hall series. My Brother's Keeper was launched by President Obama in 2014 after the tragic killing of Trayvon Martin. The president launched it in the East Room of the White House, calling on America and everybody to do whatever they could in their power to make sure young men of color knew that they matter and to reduce the systemic barriers that stand in their way and make sure every young person has every opportunity to reach their dreams. Today, the work of My Brother's Keeper continues as the My Brother's Keeper Alliance at the Obama Foundation, where we lead a network of more than 250 communities and a massive call to action to businesses, mayors, and other folks in communities across the country. Our mission is to build safe and supportive communities where boys and young men of color are valued and have clear pathways to opportunity. We're excited to have President Obama sharing his viewpoints today, but also gathered a panel of local and national experts who are fighting on the ground and who have been fighting this fight for many years. Before we start our program today, I want to acknowledge the lives of George, of Brianna, of Ahmad, and far too many others by taking a 30 minute second, 30 minute, 30 second moment of silence in order to remember those lives and reflect. Please join me in a moment of silence. Thank you. We speak their names, we hold them in our heart, and it is with their memories that we move ahead in action. It is now my pleasure to start where we should always start, with the future, uh, with a young man that I had the pleasure to meet uh, when we were at the My Brother's Keeper Ohio conference, uh, where there is an incredible statewide network of My Brother's Keeper in Ohio. This young man, Playon Patrick, blew us away with his incredible words. Playon graduated from Fort Hayes High School in Columbus, Ohio in May, class of 2020, he was a straight A student, member of the National Honor Society and a student council. Patrick will attend the Ohio State University in the fall and plans to major in criminal justice and criminology. It is my pleasure to introduce this brilliant, bright young man, our future, play on Patrick. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Plan Patrick. I'm 18 years old and plan to attend the Ohio State University. And this is 2020 Quarantine Killing. And they ask, how do black boys write about their city? How do we know streets? If we don't know uncracked sidewalk, they ask, how do these black boys know anything about their city? How the buildings are sitting on corners where brothers' bodies are still learning how to rot. There are small crosses placed in the grass where families cannot afford to bury their loved ones reminds my brothers and I that we are early graves before we are anything else. We call those corners playgrounds. We call those corners the killing fields. We call our bodies bullets. Even if we were never aimed in the right direction, we call the remnants of our mother's family in the diaspora tree. We make a catalog of prayers out of broken hands. We pray for our family tree to make its way back home to this soil. We use our hands to dig the graves we cannot afford. We are farmers of broken black bodies. We have never known city, never known comfort, never known safe street in any city. We use our feet to walk streets paved by sunlight and ask our shadows if they meant to choose this skin. 
We make a catalyst of bodies, our dinner menu, and we eat with our eyes closed. We are fed lies so easily it tastes like medicine, always conflicted between being black and being people. I wish God could have given us a choice. For years, we have been told that there is something we need to scrub off this body as if this dirt could go away. Working in the field make you realize how easily black can cook in the sun, how easily we turn on each other for a little slice of the pie. We don't know this city, how it was built with our grandmother's arthritic hands, how we couldn't have gotten a house or a bed when it was first built, when it was first settled, when it was first taken from the Indians, when our gods believed in the same beginning. We don't know home. We know how generations of our people could use these legs, could run miles on end into the night. Our faces bedazzled with the remnants of the stars. We will forever search for our forefathers' footsteps. We don't know home. We know run. We know this land has never been ours. We know how to fold ourselves into nothing. We know our sweat and tears tenderize this soil. Somehow we make fertilizer for the soil. We know how to make these hands be useful. We are the farmers of every revolution. No country was built without the piling up of dead bodies. This country just happens to be where our dead were dragged and hung up. America the land of the free and home of the brave. We fought and died for that slogan, right beside our white brothers. And doesn't that make us worth something? Tonight, a riot is the language of the unheard. I wanna take a second to thank the MBK Village and the Obama Foundation for giving me such a great opportunity to continue to spread the message. Now, it is my honor to introduce to you a man who needs no introduction. He is the founder of the My Brother's Keepers program. He is a father, lawyer, lecturer, community organizer, and so much more. Born and raised in Honolulu, Hawaii, he is the man who changed America forever. It is none other than the 44th president of the United States of America, President Barack Obama. Man, thank you. Man, that was unbelievable. Uh, and, and we could not be prouder. Uh, and you are a hard act to follow. So uh, you know, I can't wait to see all the great things that you're gonna be doing in the future. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, all the participants, all the panelists. Uh, you know, let me start by just acknowledging that uh, we have seen in the last several weeks, last few months, uh, the kinds of epic uh, changes and events in our country that uh, are as profound as anything that I've seen in my lifetime. And I'm now a lot older than Plan. I'm uh, gonna be 59 soon. Uh, and, and let me begin by acknowledging that although all of us have been feeling pain, uncertainty, disruption, uh, some folks have been feeling it more than others. Uh, most of all, uh, the pain that's been experienced by the families of uh, George and Brianna and Ahmad and Tony and Sean and too many others uh, to mention, uh, those that we uh, thought about during that, that moment of silence. Uh, and to those families who've been directly affected by tragedy, uh, please know that Michelle and I and the nation grieve with you hold you in our prayers. Uh, we're committed to the fight of creating a more just nation in, in memory of your sons and daughters. Uh, and we can't forget that even as we're confronting uh, the particular acts of violence that uh, led to those losses, uh, our nation and the world is still in the midst of a global pandemic that's exposed the the vulnerabilities of our healthcare system, uh, but also the disparate treatment and as a consequence, the disparate impact uh, that exists in our healthcare system, uh, the unequal investment, the biases, 
that have led to a disproportionate number of infections and loss of life in uh, communities of color. So uh, in a lot of ways, what has happened over the last several weeks is uh, challenges and structural problems here in the United States uh, have been thrown into high relief. Uh, they're the outcomes, not just of the immediate moments in time, but uh, they're the result of a long history of slavery and Jim Crow and redlining and institutionalized uh, racism that uh, too often have been uh, the plague, the original sin of our society. Um, and in some ways, as tragic as these past few weeks have been, as difficult and scary and uncertain as they've been, uh, they've also been an incredible opportunity for people to be uh, awakened to some of these underlying trends. And they offer an opportunity for us to all work together to tackle them, to take them off, to change uh, America and, and make it live up to its highest ideals. Uh, and part of what's made me so hopeful is the fact that so many young people have been galvanized and activated and motivated and mobilized. Uh, because historically, so much of the progress that we've made in our society uh, has been because of young people. Dr. King was a young man when he got involved. Cesar Chavez was a young man. Malcolm X was a young man. The, the leaders of the feminist movement were, were young people. Leaders of union movements were, were young people. The leaders of the environmental movement in this country and the movement to make sure that uh, the LGBT community uh, finally had a voice and uh, was represented were young people. And so when I want, when when sometimes I feel despair, I just see what's happening with young people all across the country and the talent and the voice and the sophistication that they're displaying. And it makes me feel optimistic. Uh, it makes me feel as if, you know, this country is going to get better. Um, now, I, I want to speak directly to the young men and women of color in this country. Uh, who, as Plan just so eloquently described, have witnessed too much violence and too much death. And too often, some of that violence has come uh, from folks who were supposed to be serving and protecting you. Um, I want you to know that you matter. I want you to know that your lives matter, that your dreams matter. And when I go home and I look at the faces of my daughters, Sasha and Malia, and I look at my nephews and nieces. I see limitless potential that deserves to flourish and thrive. And you should be able to learn and make mistakes and live a life of joy without having to worry about what's going to happen when you walk to the store or go for a jog or are driving down the street uh, or looking at some birds in a park. Uh, and, and, and so I hope that you also feel help, hopeful, even as you may feel angry because you have the power to make things better and you have helped to make the entire country feel uh, as if this is something that's gotta change. You, you've communicated a sense of urgency uh, that is as powerful and as transformative as anything that I've seen uh, in recent years. Um, I wanna acknowledge the, the folks in law enforcement that share the goals of reimagining policing because there are folks out there who took the oath to serve your communities and your countries, have a tough job. And I know you're just as outraged about the tragedies in recent weeks uh, as are many of the protesters. And so we're grateful for the vast majority of you who protect and serve. I've been heartened to see those in law enforcement who've recognized, let me march along with these protesters. Let, let, let me stand side by side and recognize that I want to be part of the solution. 
uh, and who've shown restraint and volunteered and engaged and listened because you're a vital part of the conversation and, and change is gonna require everybody's participation. Um, now, when I was in office, as was mentioned, uh, I created a task force on 21st century police, uh, policing in the wake of uh, the tragic killing of Michael Brown. That task force, which included law enforcement and community leaders and activists, was charged to develop a very specific set of recommendations to strengthen public trust and foster better work and relationships between law enforcement and communities that they're supposed to protect, even as they're continuing to promote effective crime reduction. And, and that report showcased a range of solutions and, and strategies that were proven and that were based on data and research to, to improve community policing and, and collect better data and reporting and, and identify and, and do something about implicit bias in, in, in how police were trained and, and reforms to use the, the force that police uh, deploy uh, in ways that uh, increase safety rather than precipitate tragedy. And that report demonstrated something that's critical for us today. Most of the reforms that are needed to prevent the type of violence and injustices that we've seen take place at the local level. You know, reform has to take place in more than 19,000 American municipalities, more than 18,000 local enforcement jurisdictions. And so as activists and everyday citizens raise their voices, we need to be clear about where change is gonna happen and how we can bring about that change. It is mayors and county executives that appoint most police chiefs and negotiate collective bargaining agreements with police unions. And that determines police practices in local communities. It's district attorneys and state's attorneys that decide typically whether or not to investigate and ultimately charge those involved in police misconduct. And those are all elected positions. And in some places they're police uh, community review boards with the power to monitor police conduct. Those oftentimes may be elected as well. The, the bottom line is I've been hearing a little bit of chatter in the internet about voting versus protest, politics and, and participation versus uh, civil disobedience and direct action. This is not a either or, this is a both and. To bring about real change, we both have to highlight a problem and make people in power uncomfortable, but we also have to translate that into practical solutions and laws that can be implemented and we can monitor and make sure uh, we're following up on. So very quick, uh, let me just close with a couple of specific things. What can we do? Number one, we know there are specific evidence-based reforms that if we put in place today, would build trust, save lives, would not show an increase in crime. Those are included in the 21st Century Policing Task Force report. You can find it on Obama.org. Number two, a lot of mayors and local elected officials read and supported the task force report, but then there wasn't enough follow through. So today I am urging every mayor in this country to review your use of force policies with members of your community and commit to report on planned reforms. What are the specific steps you can take? And I should add, by the way, that the original task force report was done several years ago. Since that time, we've actually collected data in part because we implemented some of these uh, reform ideas. So we now have more information and more data as to what works. And there are organizations like Campaign Zero uh, and Color of Change and others that are out there highlighting the, uh, what the data shows, what works, what doesn't in terms of reducing uh, incidents of police misconduct and violence, let's go ahead and start implementing those. So we need mayors, county executives, others who are in positions of power to say, this is a priority. This is a specific response. Number three, every city in this country should be a My Brother's Keeper community because we have 250 cities, counties, tribal nations 
who are working to reduce the barriers and expand opportunity for boys and young men of color through programs and policy reforms and public-private partnerships. So go to our website, get working with that because it can make a difference. And, and, and let me just close by saying this. Um, I, I've heard some people say that um, you have a pandemic, then you have these protests. Uh, this reminds people of the 60s and the chaos and uh, the discord and distrust uh, throughout the country. I have to tell you, uh, although I was very young when you had riots and protests and, and assassinations and discord back in the 60s, um, I know enough about that history to say there is something different here. You look at those protests, and that was a far more representative cross-section of America out on the streets, peacefully protesting, and who felt moved to do something because of the injustices that they had seen. That didn't exist back in the 1960s, that kind of broad coalition. The fact that recent surveys have showed that despite uh, some protests having then been marred by the actions of some, a tiny minority that engaged in, in violence, that despite, you know, as usual, that got a lot of attention, a lot of focus, despite all that, a majority of Americans still think those protests were justified. That wouldn't have existed 30, 40, 50 years ago. There is a change in mindset that's taking place, a greater recognition that we can do better. Uh, and that uh, is not a, as a consequence of speeches by politicians. That's not the result of um, you know, spotlights in news articles. Uh, that's a direct result of the activities and organizing and mobilization and engagement uh, of so many uh, young people across the country uh, who put themselves out on the line uh, to make a difference. And, and so I just have to say thank you to them and, uh, for helping to bring about this moment and just make sure that we now follow through. Because at some point, you know, attention moves away. At some point, protests start to dwindle in size. And it's very important for us to take the momentum that has been created as a society, as a country, and say, let's use this uh, to finally have an impact. All right? Thank you, everybody. Proud of you guys. Uh, and uh, I know that uh, we're going to be hearing from a, a bunch of people who have been on the front lines on this and uh, know a lot more than I do about it. Proud of you. Thank you, Mr. President. For everyone that's watching, the president uh, decided he wanted to stay and be a part of the conversation uh, that's going to be led by uh, Brittany Packnett Cunningham uh, with the Attorney General and other leaders. Uh, before we go into that section, I, I want to reiterate the pledge that the president mentioned for mayors. Uh, so if you are a mayor, you can go to Obama.org and you can take this pledge. And I also want to announce that several mayors have said, sign me up first, uh, and they have already taken the pledge. Uh, mayor de Blasio of New York, Mayor Lightfoot of Chicago, Mayor Frey of Minneapolis, Mayor Bowser of DC, uh, Mayor Breed of San Francisco, and Mayor uh, Keisha Lance Bottoms of Atlanta, um, all my brother's keeper communities as well. Uh, so if you go to that page, you can take the pledge and we will be posting all the cities and all the mayors that take the pledge. And then in 90 days, uh, we are gonna publicly report out uh, who has taken the pledge and the work that's happening to create real lasting change in communities. So it is now uh, my pleasure to introduce a friend, uh, an activist, an educator, a writer, an NBC and MSNBC News contributor, um, a lifelong activist and member of the Ferguson Uprising, uh, co-founder of Campaign Zero, a policy platform to end police violence and co-host of Pod Save the People. Uh, previously, she was an appointed member of the Ferguson Commission and President Obama's Task Force on 21st Century Policing. Uh, today, Campaign Zero, of which Brittany is a co-founder, launched the campaign hashtag eight can't wait an advocacy campaign to push mayors across America to adopt eight use of force policies that together can reduce police violence by upwards of 70%. To moderate this conversation with President Obama and our other incredible leaders, please welcome Brittany Packnett Cunningham. 
Thank you so much, Michael. And thank you, President Obama, for gathering this conversation in this moment of intense grief, but hopefully intense purpose. We are here together to talk, to have a family conversation. And you may be watching this and have come here because you are experiencing that grief and you need some community in which to do that. And you're hoping that we can hold you up to the light. You may be here because like me, you are girded in the strength of your ancestry and you know you come from people just like I do who did far more with far less and are sure that we can win in this moment and everyone after it. However you have come here, why you have come here, we're glad that you're here because we're here to get honest, to get clear, and most importantly, to get to work. So that even the heartening moments of seeing people raise their voices, or even in the moments where a police officer might take a knee, that that momentary action might turn into true systemic and lasting change. We have so many brilliant voices that have been gathered. And as we listen to these guests, we'll all be able to better understand how we got to this moment and how we seize our own power to get through it. Before we get started, like Michael, I wanna make sure to lift up the names of the people who brought us here because it wasn't just the former president, though we're deeply grateful. It was George Floyd, a father in Minneapolis. It was Breonna Taylor, a life-saving EMT on the front lines in Louisville. It was Sean Reed, a friend and a brother in Indianapolis. It was Tony McDade, a black trans man who loved life in Tallahassee, Florida. And though it wasn't from an officer's bullet, we are having this conversation, of course, in the shadow of Ahmaud Arbery, a son from Georgia, and Nina Pop and Ayanna Dior, two Black trans women who were killed by systemic hatred that comes against intersectionally marginalized people in this country every single day. Frankly, there are too many names to list because as the president has already said, we have been at this unfortunately for a long time. So that means that there is indeed work to do and now we're gonna get to do it. So Attorney General Holder, I actually wanna start with you. I was raised always to be an activist. So frankly, if you ask my mom, this is the only life I've ever known. But I came into the work specifically of fighting against the surge of police violence as it relates especially to systemic racism in 2014 when Mike Brown was killed in Ferguson, Missouri, just a few minutes from my own home. And you came to Ferguson. And as you know, there were thousands, literally thousands of brave and mighty protesters, just like the ones we're seeing outside right now, those protests and organizers were on the ground, lean for change and making the entire world pay attention. I want to know what you learned from those grassroots activists. What have you carried from those conversations in Ferguson with you through to the work that you did then and that you're doing now? Yeah, well, it's good to see you again. And uh, thank you, uh, President Obama, for convening us here today. You know, I remember back in, in, in 2014, um, I remember meeting with the, the president. We were on vacation and talking about whether or not I should go um, to Ferguson. It was a risky thing. Didn't know exactly how people would react um, to my presence, but we made the determination that I would go. And I think the thing that struck me the most was uh, there were a few things that really got me. I mean, there were young people who were there and who were unbelievably impressive, who were in a lot of ways directing um, the actions that you saw on the streets you saw a community that was in anguish and there was a, a commonality with regard to the things that they were um, concerned about. I was really struck by the fact that people consistently talked about the way in which people of color were unfairly treated by the criminal justice system. And there was a genuine desire by people to make things better. It wasn't all about just complaining. There was a genuine desire to work, to make things um, better. And I left there actually um, heartened by what I saw, both in terms of the reaction that I got. People were extremely respectful. Um, and I thought we had good dialogues while I was there. But I also left with the notion that um, if we invested some time, if we invested some uh, federal resources, that we would be in a position using the great leaders that we met there, those young people who we met there, uh, to make life in Ferguson um, better, and then use that as an example of what was possible in the, in the rest of the country.
So as the president reminded us, this is not about an either or question, right? One of my favorite things to remind people as President Obama has already done is that this is not about policy or protest. This is about policy and protest. And that we know as Dr. King and so many others throughout history taught us is that protest is actually what creates the pressure so that the policy can get passed. Similarly, we are in a long-term game and a short-term game here that while we are dealing with radical imagination and reimagining what public safety can look like even beyond police in our communities, we also have to make sure that people are safe now. In your role as attorney general, you did a lot of that work in addressing people's safety right now. So can you tell us what you learned that was instructive for this moment, particularly as you engaged in pattern and practice investigations and consent decrees once if situations like this happened in communities and once we saw the kind of uprisings that we did all over the country when you were still in office? Well, I think one of the key things that people have to understand is that there's not a tension between justice um, and having fair treatment and public safety. You can keep people safe and also have a, a better, more equitable um, criminal justice system. I mean, you know, we, uh, you know, I'm not going to get too boastful here, but, you know, for the first time in 40 years during the Obama administration, we reduced the number of people who were incarcerated in the federal system um, and also lowered the crime rate. Again, there is not that tension. You can make things better in terms of community and police relationships and keep people safe at the same time. And so what we tried to do was come up with ways in which we could look at what we what we thought were the, the problems um, in the criminal justice system and with regard to how policing um, was done, address those, involve the community in those efforts, and engage law enforcement in those efforts, bring them together um, in, in forums so that they could get to know each other, understand how difficult it is to be a, a police officer, understand how uh, communities of color have had to deal with unfair law enforcement practices over the years, you know, bring people together. And it was through that, um, through those kinds of meetings that we were able to formulate the policies that ultimately led to the 21st century um, proposals. And then the other things that we did, you know, bringing, bringing pattern and practice um, in investigations, using the power that we had under the civil rights statutes that we were able to, um, able to enforce. Uh, you know, it was, um, it was for me the highlight of my time as as attorney general. It was to given the opportunity to get into communities to um, affect positive change, to bring uh, and establish relationships between again people in law enforcement, people in uh, communities of color. Uh, that was, I think, in some ways, you know, what I'm most proud of, and it laid, I think, the foundation for uh, future for future work. But I will always emphasize this: you know, that young people young people, you know, that's our audience here today, uh, young people were critically involved in all of the work that um, we did, starting at Ferguson and other parts of, uh, of the country. I want to ask you one more question before I move on to our next speaker. You know, at Campaign Zero, we believe we can live in a world where the police don't kill people. So many of us are really trying to engage in radical imagination to imagine what our communities look like like I said, even beyond police, even looking at a moment where we don't even have traditional systems because our communities are so healthy from the ground up. When you think about your most radical dream for what is possible, your most radical imagination for where we can get to as a community and as a people, what is that dream? Ooh, um, that's an interesting one. Uh, you know, I guess my, my dream is that we would get to a place where um, people are judged on their their individual deeds, um, the individual characteristics, and that we don't um, we don't stereotype people, um, and that you know is not only with regard to how we deal, do things in the uh, in the criminal justice system. I think we have a, we make a mistake if we think that the criminal justice system exists separate and apart from the greater society. The issues that uh, we face in the criminal justice system, inappropriate uses of force, uh, implicit bias, whole range of things. Um, those grow out of the same kinds of um, problems that we see in the larger society. And so we've got to deal with problems, you know, that are more systemically, more society-wide, if we want to actually deal um, and be effective in uh, bringing about needed change with regard to the criminal justice system. So, you know, I would hope that we get to a place where, um, you know, discrimination is no longer um, a factor 
in the lives of, of, of people of color. Um, that fair treatment would be something that would be, um, would be expected. It's stereotypes, you know, born uh, in, in, in slavery. And, and the notion that, you know, in order to enslave a people, you had to think um, that they were in some ways different, some ways inferior. And those attitudes may not be um, as, as, as explicit as they once were, but still are a part, I think, of, uh, of the American psyche implicitly. And radical change, I'd like to, you know, erase those, um, those feelings and base policy on, um, you know, on, on real world experiences, on, on the reality of the people of this nation, as opposed to the perceptions of them, the stereotypes um, uh, of them. What I hear you as saying is that being able to live, being able to breathe, not having one, anyone's foot on your neck is not actually a radical idea at all, that it is what everybody is owed. Thank you so much, Attorney General Holder, for joining us. I want to move now to Philippe Cunningham, who is a councilman from the city of Minneapolis, where so much of this is centered. Minneapolis is really ground zero in so many ways, as it was home to George Floyd and his family. Philippe, I have so many questions for you, but first, I want to know how you're doing and what is happening on the ground in Minneapolis. You know, I see here on the Zoom call my friend Dion Jones, who was peacefully protesting in Los Angeles when he was hit with the rubber bullet. And we've seen so many images of that kind of unnecessary confrontation, and a lot of them, unfortunately, are coming from Minneapolis. So how is home? How is the home team doing? And what do we, we outside of Minneapolis need to understand about what's going on on the ground? Yes, well, uh, thank you so much for having me. Thank you for that question. Um, I too just want to start off with naming that I'm here today because of the strength of my ancestors and elders who came before me fighting the fight to make my existence and work as an elected official possible. So on the ground in Minneapolis, folks are mobilizing on a scale we've never seen before. And a diverse coalition, a very diverse coalition of folks is emerging demanding justice not only for George Floyd, but justice in how the city of Minneapolis protects its residents. What we are seeing right now from folks on the ground is, in Minneapolis and across the country is generations of trauma and rage at the violence bestowed on and on the black community and the dis disinvestment of the black, black community by the state at every single level of government. And I'll just add that I myself, uh, as a black, queer, transgender man, I too live firsthand both the trauma and uh, the trauma that I have to carry around experiencing the wit and witnessing state sanctioned violence, as well as the generational trauma of my ancestors who have su who survived slavery. So seeing all of this, layering it on, what's interesting about the fact that all of this has really been ground zero in Minneapolis is that we are an incredibly progressive, progressive city. At the same time, we are also the city that has the most significant racial disparities between white and black folks in the entire country across every indi indicator of quality of life. So this has just been boiling under the surface. Uh, I've been in office now for two and a half years um, and within my first two years, I had to deal with three officer involved shooting deaths in my ward alone, including one that was a suicide by cop. The trauma from those from those incidents doesn't just dissipate because the legal system deems their deaths justified. The evidence is clear overall. Uh, President Obama spoke to uh, the data that we're starting to see. Um, over-policing, criminalization, and mass incarceration have not kept our communities safer. In fact, people getting caught in the criminal justice system further disenfranchises Black and Brown folks, pushing us further to the margins of society due to criminal histories, thus triggering a cycle of involvement with crime in the criminal justice system that is often passed intergenerationally. So what we're seeing on the ground in Minneapolis is folks saying enough is enough. And our system is obviously broken and it's time for a new system of public safety in our city. Over the years, we have heard from folks who believe that the solution is simply adding more police officers. And we've also heard from folks who are reformers who want to advocate for incremental change. But even those voices right now are waning because our whole city has seen for the past three nights 
that we have the ability to keep ourselves safe and our community safe. So you ask how I'm doing, I'll say I'm a little bit tired because I've been up all night with my community, organizing my community uh, very closely with folks on the ground to post up patrol because Minneapolis Police Department, Northern National Guard, um, we're showing up to protect our homes and our small businesses. We're seeing large scale protests. What folks are seeing on the media right now, the protests and riots in South Minneapolis, we see that. But in North Minneapolis, the historically black community in Minneapolis, where I represent, we've been dealing with far right wing and white supremacist groups terrorizing our community by burning down black owned businesses. So we've come together protected our own community, and now it's time for us to systematize community-led safety strategies and make them sustainable. There's so much that you said and, and, and couldn't agree with you more on all of it. I A, want to hold space for the intersections of your identities and the way that systems particularly impact you and other folks in your community because that's such a critical part of the conversation and we cannot allow it to be erased. Um, secondly, I want to acknowledge and agree with everything that you said about the fact that we save us and we can continue to save us. That we can actually, as I've been saying, imagine this beyond our traditional systems and figure out how we protect one another and how we build up strong communities from the ground up because we are more than capable no matter what anyone else says. So that's actually what I really wanna ask you about because as an elected official, you are playing a role in a traditional system but you're also having radical imagination about what's possible. We know that budgets are moral documents and we know that as we see some cities investing more in policing, they are divesting from housing and jobs and the things that keep people well and keep their needs met. So how are you thinking about the demands that are coming directly from grassroots activists and enacting the most um, imaginative and bold, even though, as we said earlier, they should just be the things that people receive. How are you thinking about enacting those things and where does Minneapolis have to go to ensure that everybody there is not just living in a liberal city, but that they're living in an equitable city? That's right. Thank you for, for framing it that way. So when I talk about the work that needs to be done, what we have seen is that a lot of reform efforts that have been implemented, uh, we've, we had tremendous leadership uh, from our former mayor, Be Minneapolis Mayor Betsy Hodges, who came into office unabashedly demanding major overhauls in the police, Minneapolis Police Department. She appointed the first woman chief, police chief, who is also native and the first LG out LGBT police chief. Every officer was trained in procedural justice and anti-bias training a community engagement team was created. Then she appointed our first, our city's first black police chief, Chief Arredondo, whose vision for what's possible for policing is inspiring and what we would all like to see for policing. But even with all of that work, many officers have been in all but open revolt against these efforts with their grievances being aired by the police federation. So when we take a step back and look at the big picture about what does it mean to keep our community safe, we have to be thinking about it from a different frame, a different paradigm. We know that the system of policing is rooted, it's founded on and rooted in white supremacy and a history of slave catching. And so as we're trying to do this work of reforming police culture and inst the institution of policing overall, we have to get serious about investing in new alternative systems of public safety that are rooted in justice and our community. We have a paradigm for this. It's the public health approach to public safety. So thinking about violence as a disease that spreads, as a contagious disease, it spreads interpersonally and it spreads intergenerationally. And so there are evidence based strategies. I, we in Minneapolis have been working very closely with John Jay College, as well as their National Network for Safe Communities, to as, as well as Cities United. We've all been working together to really institutionalize this opportunity. I have been a tireless advocate uh, for violence prevention and intervention efforts. We created in late 2018, the Office of Violence Prevention through city ordinance. So now we can't be taken away. We institutionalized a new system, but that only goes so far. We need 
money to go into that. And that's where the budget as a moral document comes in. There's always political will to put more money into the police budget. The police budget in Minneapolis is two, almost $200 million. And we have right now, uh, we approved last year a budget of $1.6 billion. They take up a huge chunk. I had to fight relentlessly to get $50,000 for a domestic violence intervention program strategy for us to implement, despite the fact that in Minneapolis, the number one reason for 911 initiated police calls for service is because of domestic assault. We are not successfully getting to the roots of these issues. So having a systemic, institutionalized, new approach to public safety that is community-led, that invests in community with the with the, uh, the prevention and intervention, as well as thinking big, even moving further upstream, thinking about housing, jobs, employment, training, uh, education, thinking about all of that, that is what true comprehensive public safety is. And we have to start thinking about what, what does it look like to have a future without police? What, is it, what would it look like for us to not need police and then work backwards from there? I used to be a teacher, so backwards planning from everything that is possible is my jam. That's my favorite thing to do. And I'm so glad that you really helped root us in the concept of, again, radical imagination and then action toward that. So obviously there are things that have to happen in the short term. There are policies that have to change. There are investments that have to be made as you move toward those long-term goals. But I really want to, as I close with you, ask you, um, what should we all be understanding, those of us who do not live in Minneapolis, about what the grassroots uh, demands are as we are making our voices heard and attempting to be supportive of what is happening on the ground there? What should we be lifting up in the short term, the long term, and everything in between to get to that place of, as you said, comprehensive community safety that has to include not just policy, but culture and investment? That's right. Well, first I'll just say I too was a teacher. I was a special education teacher on the south side of Chicago. So uh, so the backwards planning is a good thing, right? <laughs> so um, so what, what we really need in terms of support in Minneapolis is we just need for folks to keep an eye on, on us and to be able to hold us accountable because there is some real momentum here. We, like I said, we've heard, since I've been in office, I've heard from so many folks who are just like, the only, the way we solve this problem is by just adding more police. If we just add more police, that will solve the problem. Or if we implement these specific reforms, body cams, um, diversifying the police department, anti-bias training, that sort of, those sort of reforms, then we'll see the outcomes. Um, but we really need to dig even deeper into it. And what we're seeing is a groundswell of demands for the city of Minneapolis to defund the police. That's what we're seeing right now. These folks are the ones who are transformation oriented. And so the in Minneapolis, uh, the public and political will right now are very concentrated at this point in transformational change. And things have also changed in that who is in elected office here. I'm actually not the only black trans person on Minneapolis City Council. A lot of folks don't realize that. Uh, my sister, uh, Council Vice President Andrea Jenkins is also on the Minneapolis City Council um, and she's a powerhouse. Activists and organ organizers have allies with the same vision for equity and justice who are in office now. So that really opens the possibility when we all work together. So I would say that we're, we're starting to, to, to dive into it. The state's uh, Minnesota Department of Human Rights has opened an investigation into the police department for the last 10 years for um, systemic racial discrimination. So I would say uh, what we need right now is for folks outside of Minneapolis to keep an eye on what's going on and also to invest in the folks, the organizations who are on the ground, who have been doing this work for years and years, um, and to also push folks on the ground here, communities, to make their voices heard. That is one of the biggest things is that I hear the most from the folks 
who just simply want more police. I have been labeled soft on crime because of the fact that I advocate for a comprehensive approach to public safety. So we need folks who believe in transformational change and what community safety can look like and how to get there. We need for folks' voices to be heard. We've already begun to see the seeds of so much of that transformation right there in your hometown due to leadership of yours and so many others. We saw the first black woman student body president at the University of Minnesota get them to stop contracting with the police force there. We saw that the public schools there followed suit and from former teacher to former teacher, I'm always like, yes, it's about time that we actually make schools safe for all young people um, and that doesn't need to include police. So thank you so much. Not not just for this conversation, but for your continued courage and action in the role that you're playing. I'm going to come lastly to my good friend and partner in this work, Rashad Robinson, who is the president of Color of Change. Rashad, we've been on the phone a lot in the last few weeks, um, uh, and you are always thinking so critically about how we ensure that the local conversations um, that Councilman um, uh, Cunningham just talked about are really upheld at the national level and that everyone is doing their part. As I always say, we don't have saviors, we build teams, and that's how we get the work done in community. And that's exactly the work that Color of Change does. It gives all of us an opportunity to be on the team. So how are you thinking about making sure that people understand what their role is on the team? What are um, the spectrum of demands that you are seeing coming from your members at Color of Change and that you all are exploring and pushing as you do this work? Well, thank you. First of all, thank you, Brittany, for that question. Thank you, President Obama and Attorney General um, Holder. And it's actually great uh, to be on this conversation and to be back uh, doing work with my brother's keeper. Um, what I will say is a couple of things. You know, over the last eight months, just alone, over five million people have taken action with Color of Change, uh, raising their voices online, um, signing petitions, making phone calls, uh, uh, showing up to rallies. And that's important, right? Because what we wanna be able to do is translate the presence of this moment into the ability to actually change the rules. And sometimes those are the written rules of policy and other times those are the written, unwritten rules of culture. And I wanna talk about both, about why both of those things are critically important in this moment and why we have to um, channel strategic action to actually get things done. No individual alone is gonna to work to uh, change systemic racism in all the ways that it impacts our society. Racism is like water pouring over a floor with holes in it. It will find the cracks. And so we constantly need to figure out how are we um, shoring up uh, the systems that will have cracks in them and building new systems um, for the future. And so on the written rule side, we are very much focused on um, how do you give people in that moment something clear to do, pushing for justice um, when justice needs to be served, but working, recognizing that we've got to move people up a ladder of engagement because none of the families simply want justice for their own family. They recognize that the long-term rules need to change. And when it comes to policing, there is so much that happens at the uh, local level that we have to pay attention to. The other speakers talked about it. And so we need to be focusing that energy on local policy, pushing um, to change local practice and the difference between policy and practices. Sometimes we change the laws, but we also have to change the people who implement those laws. And then we think about the work at the federal level. And we've got to change all of the ways in which money from the federal level incentivizes and disincentivizes certain types of action. And part of what we try to do at Color of Change is point people at those strategic things to do. Building sort of the energy and helping to describe for people how to do it. You know, a couple of years ago in the height of the, of the work to you know, channel, challenge uh, police violence, we came up against district attorneys and state's attorneys that we simply did not have the ability to move. We would show up, it didn't matter if we had 10 petitions, or 10,000 petitions or 100,000 petitions. They were not nervous about disappointing our community. And so we recognized we had to help the community better understand the role of district attorneys. We had to build more energy because district attorneys could operate without public pressure. Uh, these are executive level positions that can have a, a large amount, the sort of most powerful actors in the criminal justice space. 
So we built the only searchable national database of prosecutors in the country um, called winningjustice.org. We worked with folks in Hollywood like Common to develop a, a animated video that describes the role of district attorneys for everyday people so people can understand how district attorneys operate. We worked across the movement to get folks um, from big organizations to local grassroots organizations aligned around six clear demands that we could take to get people talking about treating kids as kids, um, um, reducing and ending the use of money bail, um, changing sort of reducing, um, increasing transparency. All of these things are incredibly important to sort of winning justice long-term, right? We have to change the role of prosecutors and we have to change what the public expects from prosecutors. We have to change the way that the public thinks about criminal justice. And that kind of leads me to the cultural conversation. Because for the last 20 years, for the last 20 years, basically, kind of with a couple of blips here and there, violent crime has steadily went down in our country. But according to Pew and everyone else, Americans think that violent crime is going up. And so we have a deep gap between perception and reality. And that makes it much harder when we are trying to do those critical things that the councilman talked about in terms of reducing police budgets, in terms of actually ensuring that we're investing in education and mental health and, and jobs and all the things that we know that uh, communities that have, uh, have reduced the need for law enforcement, uh, they don't need as many police. And so, because the public has been inundated with images that makes us believe that uh, um, violent crime is right around the, the window, right around the door, we've had to build a program. And through our work at changehollywood.org, through our efforts, we uh, worked with USC to do a whole study of crime TV shows. And now we're working in writer's rooms to push and change the content and the storytelling. Um, what, so one of the things that we looked at was all of these crime TV shows that are um, covered in cities like Chicago and New York, um, very diverse on air. And then you look at the writer's rooms and all the writer's rooms are all white. Folks with no sort of connection to the community, no um, skin in the game on sort of the impact of the images that they're portraying, constantly uh, putting sort of black faces on the criminal justice system, uh, a sort of magical world where black and brown people exist but racism doesn't. And we have to really work to sort of change that. And part of that activism is the work that we have to do because if we're gonna get to the place where the narrative changes enough for us to achieve the type of policy changes that are needed, we have to change the story. And I wanna say that far too often we tell a story about black communities being vulnerable. And we'll say things like black communities are vulnerable when black communities have been under attack. Black communities have been targeted. Black communities have had a history of being, of, of being uh, fleeced, of being underinvested. And all of those things are not about being vulnerable. Those are things about being on the chopping block. And so when we work to change that story, we can accomplish so much more. I have one very brief question for you because I know we have to wrap up now. People keep asking me this question, so I want to ask you, and maybe you can give me some tips. Is this moment a game changer? We've been in this work for a while now. Many people have been in it for even longer than us. But is this moment a, a seismic shift in what's possible um, where we see ourselves right now? You know, I think it's a great question because I think that we, we want fast food. We want things that are quick, and we want things that are easy. And progress and justice um, is not easy, right? The thing about inflection points is that they present the possibility for huge leaps forward, or they actually present the real threat for us to go backwards. And I think um, what we all have to recognize is that a lot of things actually have changed over the last several years. White people in a Starbucks take out their cell phone and are filming um, a police interaction that they don't actually, um, that they recognize is wrong because a movement has built the sort of mental model to train them. 
a, a major financial company, when they um, create consequences for an employee that does something racist in a park, uses the word racism in their statement in a way that we probably wouldn't have imagined them doing. That doesn't mean we give institutions too much credit, but we recognize what we have won along the way and the, and the way in which we have shifted what our demands can be. We shifted what can be possible. And so I want folks to uh, think that um, we have been the game changer. The game has continued to change. And the, the deep level of pushback that we can continue to get from forces is an absolute result of the power that our movement is building. Make yeah. no mistake, it doesn't mean that progress is a straight line. But I want us to, I want folks who are coming into this movement to not come into this movement thinking that they've got to fix a movement, but that they've got to like put on uh, their armor and join us. They've got to follow the institutions that have been driving and making so much change. And then they've got to add their creativity and their interest to what we are doing. But we have been winning. And so much of the reaction to what we are seeing is a result of the progress that I believe we are making. Precisely. The, the pushback wouldn't be so great if the progress wasn't real. Um, we are the game changer. Rashad, thank you so much. Uh, you know, we've heard in this conversation that social change work, changing our communities, having the kind of world we deserve, it's hard work, but it is absolutely necessary work. And we have to be brave enough to imagine what is possible and then go work for it and not just dream it. And we also have to be incisive enough to make sure that people are safe and whole and healthy now. Look, Black people deserve to live because we are human. And Black people deserve much more from America for lots of reasons, but in part because we often save it from itself. We know for sure that we don't just deserve to survive, we deserve to thrive. That means we need justice. And as Dr. Cornell West says, justice is what love looks like in public. So let's go make sure that love is living out loud in public. Mr. President, I see your face. I've seen that face many times before in our meetings. I know you are itching to ask a question. So I will close and hand it off to you. Well, l listen, I I've just been enjoying uh you know, hearing all the wisdom that's been spread uh, by, by so many others. Uh, I, I wanna first of all give Eric Holder his props uh, as Attorney General. Uh, he rebuilt a, a civil rights division within the Justice Department and uh, was consistently uh, on the ground working with communities, listening to communities, and coming up with practical uh, solutions to try to make things better. Uh, and, and I couldn't be prouder of him. Um, blown away by uh, Philippe and uh, all the good work that he's doing. Uh, Rashad has been a consistent uh, warrior uh, for change. Uh, you know, he was part of uh, the conversations we had after Ferguson. Uh, and and uh, Brittany, you know, you know, I think you, you're all that. Um, so, so, so as I listen, I am feeling once again inspired. Uh, and what has particularly inspired me is uh, the degree to which folks are thinking strategically, practically, uh, a, at a very detailed level about where are the places where you can make change and what are the practical solutions backed up by research, backed up by data, backed up by experience that allows us to create uh, a set of communities that are safe and just, safe and fair, safe and non-discriminatory. And that is possible. And, and I think that one of the things that has been raised is uh, th the fact that we don't, have the capacity to, to eradicate 400 years of racism in one fell swoop. Uh, so if we think that this is a seismic shift, I hope people don't feel like, well, nothing's going to happen once we figure this out. Uh, you know, uh, as, as I, I've been known to, to quote Dr. King, uh, I've said frequently, yeah, the, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. We bend it. All of you have bent it over the last four, five, six, ten years. And we are seeing the fruits of those labors in 
the degree of awareness that uh, is out there. Look, th think about some of the people who have unequivocally spoken out against what happened uh, in Minneapolis. I mean, you have, uh, I, I just saw Jim Harbaugh, the, sorry, I know we got, uh, you know, uh, the Ohio State uh, you know, contingent here, but you got Jim Harbaugh, the, 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 the coach of Michigan football, marching today. Uh, that's not something that was happening uh, five, six years ago, although Jim, I know, and, and he's been on the right side of this issue for quite some time. Um, you, you have unlikely uh, participants because all of you have worked so hard to raise awareness. That's the, that's, that's the, the progress that has been made. It doesn't mean everything's been solved. Um, the only question I, I think maybe might be worthwhile uh, for me to, to, to throw out there, even though I've read enough of the literature to, to have a, a pretty good sense of what the answer is going to be. Uh, Brittany, you mentioned that uh, you, uh, Campaign Zero has, has put forward uh, eight can't wait. Uh, we talked about uh, the 21st century uh, task force report. It'd be useful maybe to just tick off very quickly. What are the eight things that are the eight uh, uh, that, 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 that Campaign Zero is promoting? Uh, yeah, because yeah. The, for a lot of people who are watching, uh, they may be surprised that some of these things are practical and could be implemented quickly. Uh, I, I know just to, to just one off the top of my head that I know we can all focus on because it's been so painfully real these last few weeks, chokeholds and you know, strangleholds, just saying that's not what we do. Uh, you, you don't need that in order to uh, effectively uh, restrain someone. Uh, so, so give me, give me what, what are the eight uh, in, in executive summary form so people can, can hear what these specific things are. Got you. So uh, I didn't know the first question would come to me, but the eight things are banning chokeholds and strangleholds, requiring de-escalation uh, first, requiring a warning uh, before pulling out a weapon, exhausting all alternatives for those actions, um, a duty of other officers to intervene. So officers can just stand there and watch injustice happen. Banning shooting at moving vehicles. We know that keeps police and everyday citizens safe. Establishing a use of force continuum and requiring all force to be reported. And I want to be really clear. Together, those eight things can reduce police violence by upward 70%. That does not stand in competition with what Philippe just walked us through. Because we know that these things can happen immediately without any executive order or act of Congress. All we need is a mayor to have the political will and courage to stand up and say, those eight can't wait and I will go and change the use of the force standard tonight, let alone tomorrow. So do that now and then continue to work with your community because we will continue to keep up the pressure, I can promise you that, to make sure that we are getting to those comprehensive public safety uh, uh, solutions that are community-based and community-oriented and far beyond anything that we're experiencing right now that Philippe just walked us through. These don't stand in competition with imagination. These are a necessary step immediately to keep people safe as we do the hard work of making sure we get to what's That's great. And, 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 and let me just point out, uh, in my opening remarks, I mentioned sometimes this tension is posed between political participation and protest. Philippe's an example of why you have to participate politically because uh, if you are on the streets protesting and making demands, having somebody on the city council who can follow up and respond and advocate and, and deal with pushback and is in the room when budgets are made and is you know, advising mayors on how they're going to negotiate the next collective bargaining contract with the police union. You need those folks in order to ultimately deliver the goods. Uh, and and it, you know, I, I'm constantly mindful of 
the fact that this is not uh, a, a, an either or thing. And there's so many ways, all of which are necessary to make a difference. When Rashad talked about the cultural element of this, you know, uh, Dr. King, uh, you know, this may be apocryphal, but, but I think somebody mentioned to him, oh, well, you know, uh, just having an anti-discrimination bill, an anti-lynching bill, uh, you know, that's not gonna change hearts and minds. He says, no, it won't, but it'll maybe stop me from getting lynched. And that's important too. Now, so laws are important. On the other hand, the narrative and the stories and telling people here, see me, I'm human, here's my pain. This is somebody's son, this is somebody's uncle. Uh, here's the story that you need to understand about our background and our community. How do we break down stereotypes uh, as Eric, uh, Eric Holder uh, eloquently talked about? That's the work of uh, a lot of people. You know, so some are gonna be on the streets protesting. Some are gonna be running for office. Some are gonna be writing. I, during this week, uh, I picked up and reread uh, The Fire Next Time. It is frightening to notice how James Baldwin can lay out a reality 50 years ago that sounds like it was written yesterday. And that's activism, that's work, that's participation. So, so I worry sometimes that, uh, you know, as we debate strategies, uh, people start thinking there's one way of doing things. We all have a role to play, we all have a part. The more specific we are practical, you know, in the short term, as well as visionary in the long term, the, the better off we're going to be. But uh, with that, I'm going to be quiet because uh, you don't need to hear from uh, more more old head stuff. Uh, but I, I just want to say how much I appreciate all of you. Uh, and, and Michael, uh, I'm assuming that the conversation is going to continue. Yes, sir. Let me go ahead and jump in and thank Brittany for the masterful moderation and for all the wisdom and hard work that was on display. Um, I'm now going to turn it over to our Deputy Director for Network and Partnerships at My Brother's Keeper Alliance, uh, Nicole Fields, who's going to take a couple questions from our MBK communities. So not everyone watching has an opportunity to ask questions, but our MBK communities uh, do. Uh, so that's another reason you should become an MBK community. Uh, so Nicole is going to pose a couple questions, but we will get you out of here by 630, everyone. Uh, we realize that we've been on for a while, but we will be sending resources afterwards. We've also created a Google group so we can continue this conversation there as well. Uh, so Nicole, let me bring you on to uh, field those questions. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Brittany. Thank you, President Obama. Really powerful conversation. Tons of great questions. As Michael mentioned, we can continue this conversation. So if we don't get to your question, do not worry. Um, we can continue this conversation in our Google group. Um, I'm going to uh, take the first question from our young people. Um, Play on Patrick asks, um, this question is directed at Councilman Cunningham. How have the media's portrayal of frequent violent riots in Minneapolis affected your efforts to promote the work of protesters, activists, and elected officials pushing towards a self-sustaining public safety system? Yes, thank you for that question, Platon. So, uh, Playon, excuse me. So, the media's portrayal of focusing, hyper-focusing on the violent protests uh, or the, the violence and the rioting happening during the protest really pulls away from what is actually happening. The real story of the trauma and the pain and the reason why folks are out on the ground doing the work, why we are traumatized as a community, why we are doing this work um, together. So, the media is looking for a sensational story and talking about the public health approach to public safety is not that sexy. <laughs> so it's easier to be able to pick the what's happening right now, make that newsworthy. And so what it does is it's distracting. It's distracting from the voice of the folks who are on the community who have demands, who have a clear vision. It's distracting, from, it's pulling away from their voice and centering them the folks who have been on the ground nonstop for years, some in some folks in, in their cases for decades. And so I wanna make sure 
that I've been all over the media. I've been fortunate that folks have been reaching out all over the world and I keep hammering home. Everybody wants to talk about the the riots and, you know, the violence and, and you know, everything that's happening, but I always redirect it back to it is possible for us to build alternative systems to public safety outside of policing. It requires political will, it requires investment, and we are already doing it and it works. And so trying to constantly bring it back to that is really what I think it's important that we have messengers who have the platforms, the bully pulpits, as we say in politics, have those platforms to be able to speak that, we have to keep pushing it and not let media distract us from really the point, which is justice. Thank you, council member. Great, well said. Um, the next question actually was asked, a, a few folks asked the same exact question, and I think any one of our panelists can take this. Um, what advice can you give to mayors to honor protesters' demands for more police accountability and less brutal and racist practices while supporting their police force and maintaining broad public confidence. Folks have been asking, how do we change these accountability measures while also confronting police unions who have invested in our elected officials? You know, I'm, I'm going to take a stab at something just because I think it's illustrative. It, it, it doesn't answer the entire question. Uh, when I was in the state legislature uh, in, in, back in Illinois, we passed uh, one of the first, if not the first, uh, laws uh, dealing with racial profiling and traffic stops. And there was no way to get that passed without support of the FOP, the Fraternal Order of Police, the primary uh, organization of, of, of the police unions. And uh, the, the argument I was able to make to them was that uh, police officers are going to be safer if there is greater trust and less tension, that they will be able to do their jobs better if they have data that has been collected, that is clear, and Police chiefs are gonna be able to manage their forces more effectively. They will be less distracted by things that don't require uh, a, an armed response and they can refocus attention in, in, in ways that uh, are good for them as well as the community. And uh, it took a long time to make that argument. And I'm sure that there are rank and file members who didn't believe it. But in fact, after we passed it, we started being able to collect data on that issue. And the, we were able to, 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 to get them to go along. Now, it, how responsive the police union is gonna be in any circumstance, you know, it's gonna go city by city. Uh, and, and, and it's not easy. But I guess the point I am making, and, and Eric Holder, if he's still on, may want to chime in on this. I do think there is a police leadership that recognizes the need for change. But changing culture is hard. And sometimes the dynamics within the unions themselves are difficult. And, you know, and, and sometimes there's that sense of, we need to close ranks even though we know some things are messed up. And, so uh, finding ways to listen and, and recognize that they have a tough job, but also then insist that this is what we need to do. We're going to do it. We'll work with you to figure out how to do it. So when Brittany talked about the eight can't wait, you should have a dialogue to find out what specific things are a problem with not having to choke somebody, particularly when they're already in handcuffs. It, what is it that you think is a problem? I, when you force people to articulate what it is that they object to with reasonable demands of the sort that have been outlined, a, a lot of times they come up empty, uh, but you have to engage in that conversation. And 
uh, I think that it's, it's possible uh, to, to get that done. At, at the end of the day though, if you don't have the political pressure to do it, they will resist just because social, you know, the status quo always resists without some pressure. Uh, and that's why it's so important both for the protests and for the follow-up uh, that people like uh, Councilman Cunningham can apply. Great, thank you, President Obama. Next question, I'm gonna take two more. Um, this question is coming from Dr. Jim Bostic uh, in Yonkers, New York. Uh, first, he thanks our panelists and says, his question is how do we effectively integrate the generational differences in age and history often see develop between our younger generation and those of us who have been in this fight for many decades in such a way that we respect each other's ideas and approaches to dealing with institutional racism in our respective communities and not diminish the role and the will of either. So I'm gonna uh, say, I'm gonna have to call, call it here. This will have to be the last question. And I'm, I'm gonna ask one of our panelists to take that and, and, and try to give us the 90 second response. Uh, while you're thinking of your response, I just wanna say how grateful we are for Dr. Jim Bostic. Uh, Yonkers is one of our MBK impact communities that is doing extraordinary work on the ground in Yonkers and in the in the prison system in Yonkers as well. Um, so who'd like to take that question um, with, a, with a quick response? Well, I'd say this, um, you know, there is the need for young people to work with uh, people like myself who, are, who have some years um, behind them. And the arrogance of youth um, cannot be the determinant. The arrogance of, um, of age can't be a determinant. There is wisdom through lived experience there's idealism that young people um, possess in abundance. And it's a combination of that idealism with that experience that I think makes the most effective movements. Um, people who are older have to understand that um, young people have always been at the forefront of positive change in this nation. I mean, the founding fathers were really young people. The oldest Federalist was George Washington. He was only 44 um, years old. Um, and you know, uh, Richard Pryor used to say that you don't see many old fools. And so I think young people need to understand that as well. You know, there is, you don't get to be um, 60, 70, 80 years old without having navigated a whole um, series of things um, that's worthwhile. And you have things as a young person, you might want to test theories you want to try. Older people can say, well, I've experienced this and this is why this theory is not gonna work. So it is a combination of the two and a lack of arrogance on the part of both that ultimately can create a coalition that can be successful. Thank you, Mr. Attorney General. Mr. President, before we wrap up, any final words? No, keep, uh, just keep working and, 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 and stay hopeful. As I said, uh, this is a moment, and we've had moments like this before where people are paying attention uh, and that doesn't mean that everything will get solved. And so don't get disheartened because there's a marathon, not a sprint. But the fact that people are paying attention provides an opportunity to educate, activate, mobilize, and act. Uh, and I hope that we are able to seize this moment. Uh, I hope the mayors across the country who have either been watching or hear about this, take that pledge to start immediately implementing some steps that can make a difference. Uh, and I hope all the young people uh, who've been inspired and uh, engaged and involved, uh, they keep at it uh, because that's what ultimately is gonna create uh, the kind of country we want as, as, as and, and for those who have, are, have been talking about protests, just, just remember, this country was founded on protest. It, it, it is called the American Revolution. And every step of progress in this country, every expansion of freedom, every expression of our deepest ideals has been won through efforts that made the status quo uncomfortable. Uh, and, and, and we should all uh, be thankful for folks who are willing in a peaceful, disciplined way to be out there uh, making a difference. So thank you so much, everybody. Proud of you.
Thank you, Mr. President. I encourage all of you to go to Obama.org. Go to Obama.org. If you're a mayor, take the pledge. If you're looking to become an MBK community, if you're looking for places to donate or resources uh, or just to join the Alliance, go to Obama.org. Uh, we will continue to be there for you, with you. Uh, our partners at the Leadership Conference mayors are excited to provide technical assistance for you as you think about reading those use of force policies, uh, as well as our broader partner network. So um, this is just the beginning of a conversation. We'll continue this in many different ways and also be on the lookout uh, for our next town hall that will be coming up as well as some other actions. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Attorney General. Thank you, uh, Councilman Cunningham. Thank you, Brittany. Thank you, Rashad Robinson. Thank you to all of our MBK communities for the extraordinary work you do every day on behalf of our boys and young men of color and our sisters. Uh, and thank you to all of our young men and all of our young women um, for everything that you do, uh, not just to be the future, but to be the change today. Have a great day, everybody.